Uh, okay, guys, let us uh, start our today's seminar. So we're starting two hours earlier than, uh, than usual. But since we have a, a deep lockdown in Moscow, that's, that's all right for us. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor Stratus uh, Gavis, right? right? Yes, yes, correct. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, this is a young rising star from the University of Amsterdam, uh, uh, co-founder of Elagon AI, uh, director of uh, two joint labs, Deep Vision Lab with the Qualcomm and uh, another lab with the Netherlands uh, Cancer Institute and the director. Uh, so he's also got a uh, very prestigious ERC career starting grant uh, last year. And uh, his, his background is in computer vision, but recently uh, he's got interested in uh, temporal machine learning, uh, efficient computer vision, machine learning for oncology. And I think that uh, this talk will be about uh, temporal machine learning, machine learning yes. time dynamics, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so Stratus, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, for the introduction. Um, um, I, I, would, I would like to start uh, by saying that it's a, a true honor. I, I remember when you, you, you visited a few times, or at least once, uh, uh, the UVA uh, with Max. Uh, I really liked your presentation. I said, like, okay, this guy knows stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it was a great honor to, like, uh, to, to uh, be invited. Uh, and my wife is also, she grew up in uh, Moscow, so uh, it's, mm. it's, it's nice to have this uh, uh, connection. Uh, yes, so uh, uh, yeah, you just uh, gave an introduction, so no need to spend time uh, uh, on this. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, very quickly, I'm an associate professor at the University of uh, Amsterdam, uh, and uh, yeah, working uh, a lot. I'm, I'm with the Viz Lab and the Qualcomm Google Lab with Max Welling and Kay Snook uh, uh, as well. So. Um, Today, I would like to make a sort of a vision talk, uh, as in like a research vision talk. Uh, basically, um, uh, discussing my ideas for the future. And uh, please, I, I welcome any feedback. Um, I'm very curious to hear uh, uh, the thoughts of your group. Uh, so I will discuss first about the role of time in machine learning and vision. Uh, and computer vision, the key challenges as I, as I see them and the ways forward. Um, I will uh, explain um, um, or describe uh, some first steps I have done with my uh, students uh, towards simple learning and dynamics, specifically focusing on uh, the learning dynamics in deep stochastic models, equivalences in dynamical systems, and causal structure discovery. Um, and I will close with uh, some. Um, rather vague ideas on um, how uh, some of this concept can be uh, perhaps repurposed it, uh, with an eye to the science. So I believe that sciences are very relevant actually uh, uh, to temporal machine learning. So um, I, I will start simple and I'm sure you know most of the stuff, but there is a reason uh, why I do so. Um, so you all know that uh, the past decade has been the golden age of learning algorithms, and I'm sure you've been approached by all sorts of other groups and uh, faculties and companies. They're all somehow interested. And why they're interested? Um, well, now uh, algorithms can uh, do really precise pixel-wise segmentations. Um, when I started my PhD, or when I was doing my PhD around 2008, 9. 10, so a couple of years before the deep learning revolution, we, were, we would be very happy with a, uh, let's say 32% mean average precision uh, on Pascal VOC, that was the standard benchmark. And um, that was really like big, you know, like people thought that this is a very accurate algorithms. Now the same data sets are basically solved, like 90, 90 plus percent accuracies. And um, you have algorithms that can, um, uh, describe a picture or a video sometimes, uh, mostly static frames, um, in terms of text. Um, you've got algorithms uh, which you can uh, use to interpret you know, biological uh, sequences, uh, like in AlphaFold, or you've got algorithms that can beat uh, Lisa Doll, who is or was the 18 times uh, world champion in uh, AlphaGo. So what is actually fascinating is that all these 
problems are solved by the same algorithm, right? Like deep learning uh, uh, is the driving force behind all these uh, solutions, these models. And in a way that the, this is unprecedented before deep learning, uh, we were specializing in this domain, but now with the same algorithm, basically we can, uh, we can uh, deliver excellent results. Now, what makes this even more interesting is that uh, we've got a paradoxical situation. So in my uh, uh, previous research uh, from computer vision, it's a bit more applied um, uh, in general, but uh, you know there are interesting questions popping up and then you start digging and scratching uh, a bit uh, uh, deeper. We found out that uh, uh, basically uh, it didn't really make a difference uh, whether videos were reverse shuffled or normal. Uh, you would get similar performances. And of course, for some videos uh, or the other, or others uh, that would be you know, different, that would change. But in principle, you could uh, see that uh, the models had a way of scoring quite high accuracies, even in non sessical situations. For instance, when the arrow of causality, the arrow of time um, is reversed. Now, do we want that? Like, that's actually a very relevant question. Who cares? Like, if we have 99% accuracy, why bother? Well, I think we do bother because um, if we don't really know how to handle time, we cannot really do forecasting. Uh, um, we cannot uh, use it for future planning. So, for instance, um, in, uh, in, in health, uh, in the health, in the domain of health, uh, time is actually of, of critical importance. Um, and uh, yeah, we can also do not use it for any other perception, in my opinion. Uh, it's just not trustworthy as a system. The basic conclusion uh, from, from this is that state of the art spatial temporal models ignore time. And I know that this might not be the case everywhere. So for text, it's much better, uh, for instance. And that by itself is in, it's, it's a very interesting contradiction. Why it happens to work like some models have to work in one setting and not others. So the central question that sort of popped up in the last couple of years, um, and I am uh, put it uh, uh, nicely, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of molding, I'm shaping, is what is the role of time in recognition and learning? Um, is there a role? Is there a position for time? Or we just treat everything as a static and uh, that's it? Um, I think time is critical. Uh, as I will explain later, um, basically uh, the biggest advances so far in the past 20, 30, 40 years in pattern recognition was by ignoring time, by considering data static or IID, um, um, even in cases where time is obviously relevant, like in reinforced learning and memory buffers and memory replace. Lately, I see uh, time... Uh, uh, in one manifestation or the other becoming more and more popular um, in the literature. Hamiltonian neural networks uh, or generative networks, Fourier neural operators for differential equations, uh, video transformers from a more data-driven uh, perspective. They all try to um, uh, see how to handle spatial temporal patterns uh, and learn from them. So my vision is a model. I would like to have models like learning algorithms that learn temporality in entangled space type of sequences. And that is what I think distinguishes uh, uh, my questions from uh, like other similar settings that, uh, for which order is important, like a text. Um, uh, so for instance, to give a, a very, uh, let's say uh, uh, simplified example, uh, assume we've got these videos and assume that I would like to have one number, one feature to represent the video, what's going on in the video. Um, I would like, um, uh, you know, as, as uh, the car turns, uh, uh, this number to, uh, uh, to grow. Um, and I would like, um, uh, if I had this, uh, the reverse video, would like to obtain similar numbers, but uh, in the reverse direction, like in the negatives. Uh, or if I would have the same video, but Moving slower, I would like my features to uh, grow at a slower pace. Now, this is not really happening at the moment with existing algorithms, unless we really specify uh, uh, that's one way or the other, unless we really um, uh, design uh, specific models with very specific inductive biases, but then this 
cannot generalize very well. So what are the entangled special temporal data? In my opinion, it's any data with a special and temporal nature. So yeah, I started from computer vision and video, but I, as I grew interest more to core and fundamental learning, I thought, okay, what's the difference of video and uh, other types of special temporal recordings? Like, yeah, not much. Um, for as long as we've got thousands of special temporal dimensions, uh, which are confounded in multiple scales, uh, you know, in space and time, uh, I think um, uh, this constitutes entangled special temporal data. And I think in all these situations, um, standard models, like uh, the latest of the models would not work that well. And this is not just my observation. Like I've been talking with other scientists, for instance, like astronomers or physicists or biomedical researchers, they, they do have big trouble applying, you know, they, they, they try their LSTMs, their uh, well, transformers a bit harder now because of, uh, of high computation complexity. But anyways, they try the, the latest models. They don't seem to work that well when they've got sequences. So what is entangled spectable data? Yeah, of course, long and complex commercial videos, uh, but also ecological sequences, geological sequences, astronomical sequences, particles moving like or colliding, biomedical sequences and so on. Like all these, I think, are domains where existing models would have um, big trouble uh, adapting to. And why is this happening? Why do we have this paradox that while deep learning works so well in so many different uh, static domains, um, it, it has trouble with time. Uh, very quickly, I will explain, uh, I, will, I will summarize the current paradigm. So let's say we want to recognize bicycles in video frames. Uh, then we collect a bunch of pictures. Uh, we say, you know, like these are uh, the pictures where we have bicycles. Uh, and these pictures are uh, those that we don't have bicycles. And we can do an even better job by specifying which pixels uh, have uh, bicycles or not. Then we aggregate correlations locally uh, with set operations with the maximum or average. And uh, in the end, our objective is to maximize separation. Now, in this paradigm, um, uh, uh, we have a big trouble. And when we go to videos with thousands or even millions of special entangled special temporal dimensions, um, uh, the number of dynamics and correlations grows uh, innumerable really, really quickly. Um, for a standard video, even for thousands of frames, uh, 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 sorry, uh, for, for standard videos, even for moderate sequences, up to like a couple of seconds, you got, you got thousands of frames. So breaking down these key challenges, these innumerable correlations and dynamics um, pushes uh, us, push us to, uh, to uh, discard time uh, uh, by relying on uh, set operations, uh, our maximum and our uh, average functions. Um, and um, uh, uh, that's actually a huge, a huge problem. Um, with uh, very long sequences, it's also hard to annotate manually, uh, which uh, uh, you know, manual annotation is the cornerstone of most successful deep learning methods, um, whether uh, people admit or not. Um, uh, so for, uh, for long and complex uh, sequences, I believe supervised learning is uh, really debatable if it makes sense. Um, and then the typical solution is that people just focus on shorter sequences and uh, that way they can report numbers that at least they can publish in papers. Um, a third challenge is that sequences are, like one sequence is a, a one of myriad possibilities. So generative modeling is critical uh, in my opinion. And that's not super easy, at least I haven't seen very convincing works. Uh, uh, I've seen like, uh, you know, you've got your autoencoders and your um, uh, normalizing flows, now your score function, uh, score matching functions um, uh, um, to uh, produce really high uh, quality generations, but for videos, um, it doesn't work that well. Uh, and um, another challenge, in my opinion, is the lack of standardization that um, the whole complexity of the domain brings. Data is so huge, and algorithms have to be so complex that it's basically really hard to uh, compare apple to apple. And before explaining my first steps uh, forward, uh, 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 maybe I can uh, paint uh, the general uh, vision, the general idea. 
So I think that space-time geometry is going to be extremely important. Um, so uh, learning spatial temporal geometric manifolds and aggregating over geodesic time paths uh, on these manifolds, I think, um, is uh, the logical thing to do so as to take time in, into account in uh, like a better way. And perhaps, you know, neural ODs, or I just saw a paper in archive on uh, neural flows uh, is, uh, um, is a first answer towards that uh, direction. Um, space type supervision, for instance, using causality or feature slowness or continuity, anyways, temporal properties instead of manual supervision. Uh, a caveat from my experience is that um, you cannot have space time specific supervision with any model. You have to combine it with time sensitive models. So, on one hand, you, we want like models that are time sensitive and we don't really have them, not to my knowledge. Uh, uh, and on the other hand, you also want to find good ways of uh, supervising with special signals. So um, it's a chicken and egg problem. Um, we want models that are space-time stochastics that can imagine all possible futures. Uh, so generative or Bayesian models, uh, I think, is the natural uh, way here. And uh, we need better ways of evaluating, uh, so standardizing data and evaluating multiple properties and so on. Um, so this is the general like uh, uh, vision uh, where I see a gap, um, and uh, I will now describe uh, my uh, recent works uh, towards that direction. Uh, so uh, first, I would like to start with a, a work that uh, I did. We, we presented with Adil Purvis, uh, my, my PhD student, uh, as a long oral in ICML um, uh, this summer on spectral smoothing. smoothing um, for hierarchical variational time orders. And I find this a very interesting work. Um, I highly recommend to, to check it out because it contains some, I mean, I was not, uh, Adil works a lot with uh, more, has a more theoretical computer science background. So uh, uh, combinatronics, uh, harmonic analysis and so on. And there are some actually very interesting connections uh, uh, that he used. Uh, and we have some interesting insights here, uh, I think. So, okay, very quickly, um, um, I suppose most people uh, uh, here uh, know variational autoencoders. Uh, basically, uh, it's an encoder and a decoder with um, a hidden layer, bottleneck layer, uh, corresponding to a latent variable, a stochastic variable that has to follow a particular uh, prior distribution. And uh, the goal with uh, variational autoencoders is to optimize the evidence lower. Uh, yeah, to optimize the evidence lower bound, basically uh, meaning that uh, we want for our input, um, uh, uh, we want to be able to reconstruct our inputs pretty well. Um, so that's the green term here, uh, the expectation of the logarithm of likelihood, uh, while making sure uh, that um, uh, the difference, the distance between our aggregate posterior and uh, the prior that we assume for our latent variable uh, are, uh, is small. So these are two opposing forces. On one hand, uh, you want to maximize uh, or, or mi minimize the error uh, between the reconstruction and the original input. Um, and uh, so this is like, you know, uh, this would work optimally uh, if we have uh, no uh, uh, regularization, so no KL uh, term. But on the other hand, we want to make sure that um, our KL term uh, is respected in a way, such that we have meaningful interpolations that we don't overfit. Uh, so indeed here in the variational decoders, uh, we focus on the aggregate posteriors to be close to the priors. And, you know, of course, um, researchers were thinking, how can we enhance uh, variational autoencoders? Um, well, um, let's make them deep uh, is uh, a logical uh, idea. So we can make them deep by stacking stochastic layers like you know, Z1 and then having Z2 and Z3. So if your X is your um, uh, reconstruction output, uh, then uh, you can have you can start from Z3, Z2, Z1, and uh, so on. And in, the, in this case, uh, of course, the uh, elbow uh, has to be adapted by adding multiple KL terms per uh, layer um, uh, and uh, then optimize accordingly. Uh, Stratus, but uh, yes. I, I, I think that's not exactly correct because you mm -hmm. have a KL divergence between different distributions over different variables here. Yes. 
So that's probably not a chaos divergence, but a little bit different thing, because chaos divergence should be defined over distributions on the same domain. And here the domains are different, z i plus one and uh, z i. Uh, yes, but we do have two distributions, right? Right. Oh, so here, yes. So we can still compute the KL, no? Uh, well, th th that's, that, that's not KL. So I, I probably understand what you mean, but mm -hmm. uh, ah, interesting. you can't call it a KL because KL should be computed over the distributions on the same domain. And here are the distributions over different domains. Okay, Q I is see. over the i plus one and P is over the i. I see, I see. So probably this is just an expectation with respect to Q of a log operation of Q over P. Um, so there is a paper actually, I'm not sure uh, uh, which one is, uh, what's the title um, from, uh, which was specifically on hierarchical variation of the encoders and uh, um, uh, it was uh, reformulating the elbow accordingly. And yeah, they literally, I think, um, uh, use the KL, uh, uh, their uh, decomposition, but uh, that's fair point. Uh, so um, uh, yes, indeed, maybe this is more precise to uh, call it an expectation, but this doesn't matter that much uh, in the context of, you know, it will call it K or something else. Uh, okay, so, okay, sure. Uh, I think, uh, but okay, let's wait and then uh, we can discuss it again. Uh, so um, uh, the main problem that has been observed, uh, especially in the context of hierarchical version of autoencoders is uh, that of posterior collapse. So when stacking stochastic layers, often the individual posteriors tend to fall back to the prior. So uh, it's not just that the aggregate posterior uh, uh, resembles uh, the, up, not the prior, but also the individual ones. Um, and uh, this renders uh, the respective dimensions to be inactive. So they don't really produce any meaningful um, uh, features. Uh, and this is of course pathological behavior. Uh, in this case, uh, 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 the elbows can be high, but uh, uh, the activity in the, the respective neurons uh, is very low. And um, in the, uh, from, from uh, uh, Lucas and others, on a recent publication on, on understanding posterior collapse in generative latent variable models, uh, it was noted that um, uh, perhaps constraining the variance um, uh, has an effect, has an impact on, uh, on or whether we observe posterior collapse and to what extent. So our intuitive hypothesis initially was that variance somehow causes collapse. So um, uh, intuitively, when we stack stochastic uh, uh, variables, um, uh, we, uh, we have variance that uh, sort of increases exponentially. And uh, in its inability to control the stochasticity, the optimizer prefers to switch off dimensions that are uh, higher in the hierarchy and uh, 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 stick to the ones that are closer to the output, or at least this is how I uh, uh, understood it. Uh, and this is also what we observed uh, with some of our uh, experiments. So for now you can uh, ignore uh, this, this is the, the result with our model, but uh, um, with the standard VA, you would have um, that the KL divergence uh, is really uh, grounded. <clears throat> uh, very quickly. So you may have a question? Sure. Uh, how much samples do you use during training this variation of encoder? Uh, I think we uh, here we, we uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly the details uh, of uh, uh, the implementation uh, for uh, the training. I think we use the standard ones, uh, so single sample, and then uh, 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 for evaluation, we uh, we use multiple samples to compare uh, fairly against the lead. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, it's a very interesting point because for our method, we have to do some extra samples as I will explain. Um, right, so uh, yeah, this is what we also observed that the variance causes the collapse. Um, and um, uh, then Adil came up with the idea uh, of uh, using uh, basically the ornstein ullenbeck semigroup from Gaussian analysis of functions. So uh, this uh, operator uh, is uh, basically an expectation on the uh, Gaussian function. Uh, and uh, uh, the expectation is with respect to um, 
actually a new sample, uh, Z prime. Um, basically uh, sampling around uh, the original value of, uh, of Z and taking the average. Uh, so here Z1 is uh, uh, our uh, sample Gaussian, uh, where we noise up around our latent variable Z uh, and rho is a smoothing parameter. Now, uh, this uh, smoothing parameter can be between zero and one. Uh, it doesn't matter which uh, value precisely, uh, but uh, as I will show next, um, it has a really a big impact uh, uh, in specific ranges. Um, and uh, uh, second. yes, and uh, Orn Ornstein uh, Ulebeck's uh, uh, smoothing has some very favorable properties um, uh, that makes them make them interesting. So um, first of all, they preserve expectations. So by uh, uh, Taking uh, uh, by noising up our latent variable, we can still uh, obtain the uh, same expectation in the end. Uh, and uh, additionally, uh, they behave uh, nicely with Hermite expansions of uh, Gaussian functions. So if our Gaussian function um, uh, can be uh, expressed in terms of uh, some basis, uh, Hermite basis functions, um, uh, and we apply our uh, ornstein ulm semigroup, <clears throat> then we have uh, these uh, uh, raw to the power of uh, A uh, factors that um, uh, sort of sustain uh, higher order terms uh, with uh, like, let's say uh, higher intensity. And uh, uh, the uh, ornstein ullenbeck semigroup can be seen as an operator which interpolates between uh, the function and its uh, expected uh, value. Now, um, uh, I realize here that I, I forgot to add uh, that um, uh, in, in previous uh, uh, work of ours with uh, Adil, uh, in last year's ICML, we showed that uh, uh, basically uh, the variance corresponds to up to the second order uh, uh, degrees of uh, uh, this Hermite expansion. So uh, by applying the... Um, uh, ornstein ullenbeck uh, smoothing, uh, we uh, reduce this higher order degrees. Uh, and by doing so, uh, uh, we obtain lower variance model. Um, so yeah, this is how we define the ornstein ullenbeck VAEs. Uh, for VAEs, we've got uh, Gaussian functions in our uh, latent variables, and we replace uh, uh, them with smooth ones, <clears throat> as simple as that. And we can train the model with a smooth version and uh, evaluate without smoothing uh, even, uh, of course. Um, and in that case, it can be shown that there is a bias uh, variance uh, trade-off. Basically, uh, with uh, uh, this um, uh, type of VAEs, we can reduce the variance by O uh, rho squared uh, while causing bias with uh, uh, one minus rho squared. <clears throat> Um, now, uh, uh, first, I would like to show some results uh, uh, with respect to active units. So VAs with four stochastic layers were tested here on MNIST, and uh, we compared with other methods that uh, were proposed uh, against posterior collapse. Um, and uh, uh, we focus on the KL diversion, divergence of uh, 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 the last uh, uh, latent. Um, so we compare with uh, IWA, uh, VA plus KL annealing and three bits. And uh, we observe that um, basically we maintain uh, activity in all neurons and all uh, layers uh, while having um, uh, um, generally um, uh, lower, uh, lower uh, uh, like better elbows. Um, uh, we see that uh, like recent models, they do have trouble actually here and here uh, with um, uh, keeping neurons uh, active, especially in the top layers. Whereas um, in uh, the ones closer to the reconstruction, it's uh, uh, much better. Uh, in our case, uh, uh, the raw didn't seem to make a very big difference, although of course it does uh, uh, have an impact. 
uh, strategies and uh, how does uh, it affect the, the quality of generation? Uh, the quality was pretty good. Um, let me see if I have. Uh... Oh, but is it, is it better than in, in conventional models with a posterior collapse? Uh, ah, uh, I think there was, it was similar, like for the construction, but the generations were better. I mean, the ones that were posterior collapse, they don't really, uh, uh, they didn't do that well as, uh, as as we did, if I remember correctly. Yes. Well, uh, the, the, the reason I'm asking is because uh, there can be different hypotheses that uh, posterior collapse happens anytime when you just do not need so many latent variables. That's actually a very good point. We had a similar uh, question from uh, from uh, the reviewer. Uh, we had long uh, <laughs> reviews and rebuttals about this, uh, and we uh, explicitly tested whether um, uh, you know, like posterior collapse is a way of uh, feature selection, and uh, we found out that this was not the case. Lit literally, uh, really not the case. So um, uh, the, the dimensions were uh, indeed needed. Uh, the generations to be certain. I'm not very uh, uh, sorry. To be precise, I'm not sure if they were that much better because it's MNIST after all. Uh, but uh, we, we generally had the good reconstructions and good generations. Well, uh, if, we, if we consider the elbow values, mm -hmm. so what can we say? If we have posterior collapse, then KL divergence becomes smaller, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so here you, you, um, you have uh, got rid of uh, posterior collapse, but still you mm -hmm. have a better elbow. This means that reconstruction error became much smaller mm -hmm. than it was uh, in conventional yes. VA. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so this is definitely one interesting aspect. Uh, in a way, the model does seem to succeed in maintaining activity and avoiding posterior collapse. And um, in, in practice, uh, uh, how does this translate? That we have competitive results with very simple architectures. Now, I want to be fair, there are much better models if you're interested in elbows, like in VAE, like I think it's one of the best, even though it's not the best model right now. Uh, there's ladder VAE, there's Biva. Um, uh, so ladder VAE is uh, similar, like on par with us. It's a bit also older model. Um, one thing to notice here is that we do have very simple architecture. Basically, we, we, uh, the goal was not to uh, uh, solve posterior collapse at all costs. Uh, we just wanted to see whether uh, we can do so by controlling perhaps uh, variance a bit. This means that uh, we can have much simpler models of a fraction of the parameters. And our architectures are dead simple. They're just like literally just um, um, standard hierarchical VAEs. We don't have any skip connections or, or um, uh, other uh, uh, improvements, which uh, I suppose we have not really tested, which but I suppose uh, uh, would improve the results further. <clears throat> what is the most interesting, however, in my opinion, uh, with this work is that, um, You know, of course, uh, the logical thing to do is to uh, start checking what goes, uh, what happens when you're playing with raw, with uh, the raw value. Um, uh, and when we did that, uh, uh, we were surprised to see that uh, we observed very consistently and across different data sets, given the same architecture, like in all definitions of consistency, uh, uh, sudden transitions. So basically, um, uh, the raw didn't really uh, matter that much uh, up to uh, a point, and then uh, crossing a threshold, like it started working or it started collapsing, depending on uh, on uh, where uh, uh, you come from. Um, and this uh, uh, observation was even more attenuated when increasing the architectural complexity. So when we increase the uh, width uh, with three layers here, not four, but with a uh, uh, wider layers, or when we added convolutions, um, uh, the amount of raw that we had, uh, so we had to make the models uh, more deterministic in that sense. Um, and um, the, the, the difference was sharper. So there was a, a more like L-shaped here transition compared to here, which was more like curvy. 
Now, yeah, why is this happening? That's actually a very interesting uh, uh, question. We don't really have an answer. I don't have an answer yet, but I have some ideas and intuitions. If you have uh, uh, any thoughts or if you've seen uh, similar works or similar observations, I would be very uh, interested to uh, hear. Um, uh, what we did uh, uh, from this point on was uh, to, um, to try to compare phase transitions and posterior collapse, and we observed that indeed um, uh, there, is, there are some interesting patterns. So here we trained several VA models of different um, widths and depths, and uh, uh, we measured different metrics. Uh, so uh, the acting, act, active latent uh, uh, variables or the KL divergence of the last layer or, uh, uh, or the elbow for both the uh, VAs and uh, our models. So for the VAs, for the standard VAs, we observe a sudden transition. So uh, for the one uh, layer uh, uh, versions, it's uh, pretty, it works pretty all right. Uh, and uh, when you increase uh, uh, the uh, depth, uh, most uh, units uh, suddenly become inactive. Um, uh, <coughs> and, uh, so uh, whereas uh, for uh, our uh, version of the model uh, uh, with the Orsay Olympic smoothing, uh, the transitions are much uh, smoother because of, of uh, controlling the variance better. Uh, why is uh, uh, the KL divergence non monotonic? Uh, why, why is it monotonic with, with the increase of stochastic width? So, Sorry, you, you I couldn't, compute, hear, you. Uh, I couldn't uh, hear the question. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, let's consider the plots with the KL divergence of the last stochastic layer. Yes, here. Uh, for MNIT VAE, uh, we have a monotonic dependence. So, the larger is stochastic width, the larger is KL divergence. Mm -hmm. Why does it happen? Uh, do you compute yeah. <laughs> just total KL divergence or you normalize it with respect to the number of hidden units? Um... Because in the first case, I understand why the, the, the value of KL divergence increases when you increase the stochastic width. Mm -hmm. In the second case, I do not. Uh, but what do you mean by cases here? Like the rows, you mean? Uh, rows, yes. So uh, you have stochastic width on the x-axis, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the larger is stochastic width, the larger is KL divergence. Of yes. Stochastic layer. Yes. Yes. So why why it happens? Because you simply sum up all KL divergences of all hidden units on the uh, top stochastic layer. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I I I don't have this uh, answer from the top of my head, uh, but I think. Um, uh, yeah, did we normalize here or not? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I should ask a deal, but I think um, uh, I, I think we did not. Uh, uh, I think mm -hmm. we did not. Then, then, then it should be uh, a kind of cumulative sum, and it should, of course, increase with the increase of the uh, width of stochastic, stochastic width. Okay, that's yeah. a good question. I have to ask uh, a deal about that. Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so we observed this uh, uh, sort of phase transition, uh, and um, so why is this happening? That's not something that I have uh, we have been able to answer. Like, I'm trying to investigate this uh, further. I think that there is actually a link to statistical mechanics uh, perspective. So I, I tried to. I was at the time I was a bit interested on. Um, I know I, I had read the Landau's uh, mean field theory, and I tried to apply this here. Apply it here. Uh, it seemed to sort of uh, uh, work uh, or explain some uh, some observations, but in very simplified cases. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, we haven't really uh, explored this further. Uh, in general, I find I think that maybe there is a connection with my, what makes a system learnable. So my question here, or like how I interpret it here, uh, this observation is, I mean, sure, some VAEs or some architectures will be better than others, but what makes uh, uh, what what makes uh, one architecture or one uh, uh, model to be able to learn in the first place and uh, whatnot. Like, is there a transition? Is there a phase transition um, in a more general sense? Uh, is there something that uh, uh, we can uh, learn and uh, uh, maybe I try to understand uh, or, or 
or be able to predict which types of uh, models uh, in general can be successful or not. <clears throat> um, yeah, so this was about this work. Um, and um, a, a follow-up work, uh, sorry, a, a, another work that I think is very interesting uh, uh, is uh, with uh, Philip Lippe uh, Taco, and Taco Cohen um, on efficient neural causal discovery without cyclistic constraints. It's currently in submission, and it was pre like it was also accepted as a UAI workshop. Um, so this uh, different problem. Uh, as a quick introduction, um, uh, well, we we've all heard uh, about correlation and causation, and um, uh, this uh, uh, example is a very uh, good illustration of why we need causation in our. Uh, in our uh, systems. So um, if we were to uh, measure correlations, we would uh, obtain, we would uh, infer that um, eating more chocolate uh, makes a, a country generate uh, uh, more uh, Nobel uh, laureates, which is obviously uh, a false, uh, a false um, uh, let's say, insight. Yeah. In, in reality, what happens is that uh, there is, uh, Another variable, uh, the average wealth, which uh, connects to chocolate consumption and other prices. So there is a causation uh, uh, here uh, that has to be uh, learned instead. And um, uh, a very important problem. So here, like in in, uh, in causality, um, there are two big problems: um, causal discovery and causal inference. Um, so in causal discovery. The idea is that we have all our variables and uh, we want to fi find causal uh, relations uh, from data. So we collect data and we want to uh, basically create this uh, network, this Bayesian network uh, that uh, explains how the different variables uh, um, affect each other. And uh, in, in these settings, usually uh, we have intervention capabilities so we can change the variable distribution. Um, and uh, um, yeah, causal discovery from intervention data on all variants, uh, oh, sorry, on all variables is in, in theory possible. However, in practice, it's very hard for large graphs and data sets. And uh, what um, uh, one will see uh, when reading uh, uh, papers in the literature is that generally most papers focus on uh, small sets of uh, variables up to five or 10 or 20, maybe 50 when scaling up. Um, and on rather uh, simplified uh, setups, also because it's hard to uh, have very realistic uh, experiments here. Uh, and um, right, so um, uh, some recent related work uh, is on continuous optimization, uh, score-based causal discovery. So in a way, again, using neural networks and uh, casting the problem uh, as uh, um, uh, finding like or or, or scoring uh, different uh, um, uh, let's say uh, networks, different uh, Bayesian networks according to um, uh, their uh, um, how well they fit the data and the, uh, the observational and the uh, interventional data. And we have here a search space of possible graphs with gradient-based methods. Uh, usually, the main problem here is that how can we limit the search space to directed acyclic graphs? So. And uh, when we have these continuous optimization uh, methods, um, it's not obvious how we can uh, make sure that there are no cycles in the end. Um, another problem is how scalable is the method? And in the end, what guarantees do we have to find the correct graph? Now, uh, these guarantees are typically expected to be of, um, of a theoretical nature. And one of the reasons is that um, you know, in the absence of very realistic settings or very large scale data sets, a theoretical guarantee can at least uh, tell you uh, that you, the method is going to work in the end, even in unknown problems. Uh, so uh, in this work, uh, we propose uh, an algorithm uh, called the Fission Neural Causal Discovery or ENCO. And the central idea is to learn distributions from observational data and then test the generalization to interventional data. This is not uh, very different from uh, other recent works in the literature. Um, I think uh, Benjo had uh, uh, a very nice uh, paper uh, 
last year in 2020 uh, based on like on which you know from which we uh, we are very much inspired um, uh, and uh, uh, with Enco the basic idea here is uh, to parameterize the graph with edge existence and orientation parameters so previous works uh, uh, try to use a single parameter to uh, uh, model uh, the edge orientation and uh, uh, having an edge or not. Uh, however, we show in this uh, work that uh, the uh, orientation is essential for breaking the loops and making sure that uh, we have no cycles. And by doing so, uh, we can uh, enforce uh, acyclicity without any ad hoc constraints. Um, so in this uh, method, the probability of an edge is simply uh, the uh, a sigmoid of uh, uh, the orientation and the existence, and the goal is uh, for the probability uh, uh, the probability for correct edges to go to one, while all others to go to zero. So uh, in the end, uh, we obtain the uh, the right causal graph. By doing so, um, uh, we don't need any constraints or regularizations for us, basically. Um, and uh, a, a more visual explanation of how the process works. Uh, in the beginning, yeah, we, 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 we're alternating in, a, we have an alternating optimization um, between distribution fitting and graph fitting. So uh, we have a single, uh, we have different neural networks per, uh, 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 variable and we're learning uh, this uh, posterior uh, um, given all other uh, conditioning variables. Uh, we have yeah, one neural network, as I said, uh, uh, per variable. And then after uh, uh, doing the uh, uh, fitting of the, these uh, distributions, uh, we're um, uh, inferring the graph. <clears throat> And where, where do you, where do you mm -hmm. use the graph that you have uh, inferred in distribution fitting? Yes, exactly. So we alternate between uh, the two steps until uh, convergence. Um, so uh, yeah, in the graph fitting, we learn the edge and orientation parameters based on the fit distributions. And then we go back and try to learn even better um, uh, conditional distributions uh, on the observational data. Uh, yes, but Stratis, I, I, I still... Uh can't understand uh, how do you use the knowledge about your graph in distribution fitting? Because you, you fit a distribution, then you perform mm -hmm. graph fitting, then you use uh, this new graph for, for improving the distribution fitting, right? Uh, yes. But the question is how? Yeah, what so depending, I mean, uh, uh, depending on the graph that we have, we sample graphs, uh, after graph and graph fitting, we sample graphs, and uh, based on that, we compute log likelihoods in the end uh, for the distribution fitting, and then we back to the group. Uh, do you understand, right, that uh, when you perform distribution fitting, for example, for X1, you mm -hmm. condition it only on its uh, ancestors according to the graph? Yes, 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 yes. Ah, okay. So not, not on all other variables, but just on... No, this. no, no. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. indeed, indeed. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I, I mis, uh, mis uh, expressed myself. I meant that uh, uh, these neural networks are going to be reused for any possible conditioning variable uh, variables here. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, um, uh, uh, when we sample a graph, we condition only on the parents, on the ancestors. Only. Thanks. Thanks. So um, uh, uh, the process of graph fitting works. Uh, uh, in, in, in steps, uh, as I explained, um, uh, we first sample the graphs, uh, and uh, based on that, we estimate log likelihoods and uh, average. And in the end, by doing so, we can determine the gradients and back propagate. Um, <clears throat> now, what is uh, the main technical innovation? Because, I mean, so far, we basically uh, in a way, we propose a different way to parameterize edges, but okay, that's not super big. Um, um, but uh, what we uh, uh, show actually is that, um, um, you know, if, if you were to do learning uh, without any, uh, you know, as is, we would have very high variance uh, uh, gradients, uh, variance in the gradients uh, for, uh, for, for our edges. Uh, and uh, in this work, uh, we uh, uh, propose um, uh, 
a new class of low variance grade estimators based on uh, the uh, causality uh, relations between uh, the variables. Uh, so uh, basically how it works is that we sample and evaluate K graphs to estimate whether an edge is beneficial or not. Um, and um, we similarly do for orientation parameters, but uh, only with interact, uh, direct interventional data. By, uh, uh, by taking this uh, uh, into account <clears throat> uh, on, on graph data and samples and uh, averaging, we, uh, we can have, let me see if I have the, uh, here, the yes. Uh, uh, we can obtain uh, uh, gra gradients with uh, uh, much lower uh, variance, which means that we can uh, uh, have, uh, you know, we can scale much better um, uh, and uh, work with much larger uh, um, uh, sets of uh, variables. <clears throat> uh, in the what, end, we have, sorry, yes? Uh, what is the idea of the variance reduction used here? Um, let me see, I think there is a slide for that. Uh, let me see if I have it. Because from our experience, I know that the, the, this can be of crucial importance uh, to invent new variance reduction technique. Uh, it's, it really can make uh, in practical methods a practical one. Yeah, so uh, let me, I, uh, I don't have the equation uh, uh, here, but let me, uh, it's very easy. Oh open the overleaf and <laughs> I can show you. So uh, the main difference is that uh, we don't have in the denominator. Uh, if you want to, to show something in a different application, you should, you should change the application when you share the screen. Yes, yes, I will do that. Almost there. Uh, do you see it now? Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, here, uh, 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 so previous methods uh, were having a great estimator like this. And because of this expectation in the denominator, uh, the uh, variance of the gradient um, uh, was uh, very much uh, influenced. Um, our uh, here, this is our uh, uh, mm -hmm. gradient, and um, uh, by our reparameterization uh, with respect to uh, a different parameter for the edge and a different parameter for. Sorry, for the edge orientation and uh, for the edge existence, we go away with this uh, annoying little term, which makes it, uh, you know, like then the variance uh, is much more manageable. Mm -hmm. So you change the parameterization in, in, yes, in exactly. graph, right? Exactly. And this was the key to variance reduction. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so it was, uh, it was very interesting because uh, day after day, we could uh, then uh, come up with uh, better and better ways of, of doing that. But yeah, that, that's the basic idea. We, we, the the reparameterization was uh, showing uh, what, was, uh, what uh, led to uh, the violence reduction. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only that, but um, uh, what is uh, very important as well is that... Um, so uh, um, with that, we could uh, provide even theoretical guarantees for finding the true graph. So basically the main conditions is that um, for every edge, uh, xi to xj in the causal graph, um, uh, the edge uh, uh, i to j must not be decent of advantages for the log likelihood. And uh, also it must have uh, a greater impact on the likelihood, log likelihood estimate than the sparse the regularizer here. <clears throat> So uh, basically, this has to be larger uh, than this. Um, and uh, uh, 
Um, by doing so, we were uh, we, we can guarantee that uh, we will end up, uh, you know, or uh, we can guarantee that uh, the uh, the optimum uh, will correspond to the uh, the true graph. Now, if the assumption is not fulfilled, uh, we can still often uh, find the correct graph. That's what we observed, uh, and the assumption is not fulfilled in the case where uh, we don't have uh, interventions on. Uh, all variables. So one of our weaknesses or limitations is that uh, the theoretical guarantees um, apply only when uh, we assume we can intervene on all variables. But of course, in practice, uh, that uh, cannot uh, always be uh, assured. Um, empirically, we found that this is not a very big problem. Uh, we could uh, still uh, obtain the correct graph, of course, uh, up to uh, an equiv equivalence class, uh, because for those variables for which we have no intervention, we cannot really uh, know, uh, not, not just us, but it's, it's impossible to recover the, the true uh, causations uh, without additional assumptions about the data and the settings. And what do you mean by intervention? So, um, you know, it's, it, imagine that you have a setting, for instance, um, uh, like a medical setting uh, on uh, cancer, smoking, uh, and uh -huh. so on. Intervention means that, uh, you know, uh, you reduce smoking, for instance. Um, uh, or, um, you know, you might also have genetic factors. The genetic factors you cannot intervene on, right? Like you cannot change your DNA, uh, but you can right, intervene right. on the smoking. Uh -huh. I see. I see. So uh, when you can intervene on all variables, we can show that theoretically you can uh, uh, converge to the correct graph. Uh, but this is a bit, uh, uh, I, I don't show it here because it's a bit more yeah, technical and not super interesting per se. I mean, uh, you have to go into the equations and uh, show that we always obtain a better and better local likelihood. That's the basic idea. Um, um, uh, but the main, the main, uh, the main, uh, the main um, uh, take uh, whole message here is that uh, uh, this only works uh, only. Uh, this only works if you can intervene on all variables, which is not necessarily the case in most problems. Uh, however, um, uh, in practice, we did see um, uh, that um, the results were good nonetheless. So uh, for our experiments, we uh, uh, recover synthetically uh, generated graphs. Uh, we tested quite a few. Um, uh, on uh, graph uh, uh, graph sizes of up 20 to 25 nodes uh, initially, um, measuring the uh, structural humming distance. Um, so you can have like a chain chain graphs. So you want to recover chain graphs or full graphs, so everything is connected to everything, or collider graphs or random graphs. And um, yeah, these are synthetic data. Um, uh, we, we manage this, and here it's like with a full, uh, let's say, you can intervene on all variables. Um, by doing so, um, we, um, we were able to actually obtain the, literally the correct graph with almost no errors. Well, with no errors in most cases. Um, um, compared to uh, the literature. Uh, so SDA, DCDI, these are very recent methods. Um, and uh, when trying also realistic graphs, so not just synthetics, uh, uh, synthetic ones, we could still obtain um, uh, very low errors in most cases. Uh, again, this is with uh, uh, the assumption that all variables can be intervened on. Uh, we obtained very similar, so yeah, later on we, we run also experiments with um, uh, settings uh, where you intervene only on a subset of variables and we could still obtain much better um, uh, graphs than uh, competitors, even if, even if we uh, do not, uh, we cannot guarantee uh, that. And uh, regarding scalability, <clears throat> yeah, in these random synthetic graphs, uh, we, uh, we, we just pushed. So uh, adding 100 nodes or 200 nodes or 400 nodes or even 1000 nodes, uh, basically we could perfectly recover uh, uh, the graph. Uh, uh, the DCDI um, uh, had a much higher computational complexity um, <clears throat> and also quite large errors. Uh, so we had to stop it uh, with 400 nodes. We could not uh, scale it up. And um, uh, the SDI um, 
basically gave worse results, it was still possible to, to, uh, to run it with larger graphs, but it just didn't uh, give very good results. Um, now, yeah, I'm a bit over time, I think. <laughs> uh, so maybe I go very quickly uh, over this work. Um, so this is uh, a work that will be presented in the next Europe's uh, uh, titled What to Translated Local Coordinate Frames for Interactive Dynamical Systems. Uh, with Milton Kofinats, uh, Navin Shakar Naharaja from BMW, uh, and myself. Uh, and this is a very simple method, and that's what is uh, perhaps interesting. Uh, so uh, um, the problem setting here is dynamical systems that interact in space and time, um, and uh, specifically, you know, systems of interacting objects that have highly nonlinear and time-dependent behavior. Um, <clears throat> So in, often these settings, um, uh, we typically hard code them uh, given four nodes, for instance, uh, the trajectory of single uh, pendulum and the complexity increases very quickly. So if you go from a single to double pendulum, um, basically it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, you cannot analytically uh, solve it, um, uh, but the idea is, can we learn dynamical systems from observations instead? So we don't have to have an analytical solution, but maybe we can actually learn from data. And um, such systems are, you know, we can have them, uh, we can have many examples uh, of them in, 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 you know, around us. So for instance, vehicle trajectories, particles colliding, material molecules, uh, intuitive physics, uh, and so on. Um, so here, what we, uh, what is our basic idea is that, um, the dynamics in these systems do not matter uh, or they do not depend on the reference frame. So if I am the bicyclist in this scene, uh, how the car, like any car, any van will move, does not depend on my position, my viewpoint or angle, right? So that's the basic idea. Uh, and uh, this uh, should imply then that input representation should also be invariant to rotation and translation arbitrariness. Uh, the problem, however, is that uh, current models uh, uh, do not have that. So, for instance, if you have neural re relational inference from Thomas Kipton, Max, uh, Max um, um, they assume one coordinate frame in the beginning, and that's it. Um, so, what we propose in this work is local coordinate frames. So, simply change the input representation according to the heading of uh, of uh, each object uh, in the system. So uh, for instance, this is what um, the neural relational inference model uh, uh, would look uh, like, like, would, would, like the input that it would receive. Now, what we're saying is that, okay, for uh, the pink object, uh, we have to move it to the uh, 0, 0.0 coordinate and uh, uh, rotate, uh, rotate it so that uh, it's heading, it's, uh, um, rotation aligns with uh, the x axis and of course they have to rotate all other systems accordingly um, you we do the same for all other objects and then our final representation is uh, the concatenation this uh, very simple idea can then be uh, deployed uh, using any other uh, model in our uh, paper we uh, use the uh, neural dynamical inference uh, model, as well as the dynamic variant of it, uh, um, which was for uh, longer se sequences. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, it, it worked uh, particularly well. Well, surprisingly well, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, this is our curves. So basically, uh, this shows that um, rotation and translation uh, um, can, uh, equivalence to rotation and translation have actually a very big impact uh, when you have these uh, 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 systems. And um, I'll see here also the, let me see if there's a video here. So these are particles uh, colliding um, and in the, um, uh, Dark color uh, is the ground truth. The light color is the prediction. And as you can see, uh, uh, they are uh, uh, pretty similar. Uh, the same algorithm, the same basically representation um, is uh, working very well also with uh, uh, traffic data. 
So one must take account, you know, uh, the point of view of other uh, objects to make good future predictions and it generalizes very well to different uh, settings. Um, and uh, yeah, closing now the presentation. Um, in my opinion, um, the majority of scientific recordings are videos or spatial temporal sequences one way or the other, which offers, for, uh, uh, offers endless opportunities, exciting problems. Uh, it, it means that, uh, you know, unless uh, we've got an algorithm that basically, or a family of algorithms that work pretty seamlessly for all these situations, uh, then uh, I, we're not done yet. Um, and our I3Ds and trackers and deep networks should work with any space and time signal. Um, yeah, in, in my proposals, um, I offered uh, these examples, like climate science has um, very interesting uh, problems, biomedical physics, oncology, causality, ecology, astronomy, particle physics, all have special temporal recordings, and um, our model should work uh, uh, there. Uh, and what is very interesting is whether we can actually then use, uh, uh, so on one hand, we can uh, try to expand scientific knowledge, and I think that's uh, one of the major, um, will be one of the major innovations in the next, uh, let's say, five to 10 years, like physics-inspired neural networks and physics-inspired uh, machine learning. Uh, we see it coming stronger and stronger. So Max, for instance, went to Microsoft uh, to work with molecules. And uh, I don't know, I keep getting uh, Twitter uh, tweets uh, about uh, new cool methods uh, working in different settings. You got alpha uh, fault uh, uh, for general operators to uh, basically model partial differential equations with very high accuracy. I think uh, that's going to be a very promising direction. And um, uh, another interesting or exciting uh, aspect of it is that we could also use scientific knowledge as ground truth. So in, in my experience, uh, quite often our ground truth uh, annotations are very subjective and it's hard to, to compare. Uh, but if we were to use scientific uh, data, we can... Uh, um, uh, in specific settings, of course, use the scientific knowledge to basically uh, evaluate how well our algorithms uh, uh, are doing. And um, yeah, I think that will be very uh, interesting and perhaps a more fair way to uh, compare different algorithms. So uh, yeah, beyond that, I'm doing, I'm, you know, I'm having much, uh, I've got other works as well, like more research on normalizing flows and Siamese trunkers, uh, 3D deep learning and implicit functions and so on. Um, and um, yeah, currently as part of my, uh, you know, I'm building my own team as well uh, at the moment, looking for a postdoc. So uh, if uh, anyone here is finishing their PhD and uh, is interested in, in advancing, uh, uh, or like uh, not advancing, but continuing on, on machine learning, uh, computer vision and so on, um, please drop me a line. I, I'm always also looking for motivated PhD candidates. Um, and uh, um, there is a very broad uh, um, spectrum of uh, research. Of course, I'm also always uh, more than interested uh, in, in collaborations. Uh, that's uh, half uh, the fun in research. Uh, yeah, and my 10 home message, uh, I believe that you know, we are going to be observing a shifting paradigm from static to temporal data. Um, I cannot imagine that the best we can do is uh, static images or static frames. The world is open-ended, um, it's not closed, um, it's non-IID, um, it's changing uh, all the time, it's not stationary. Uh, I think that uh, our models have trouble with that, uh, all that, so I think that um, this is where um, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, the research uh, 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 a lot of researchers will focus on uh, next. Um, I think that geometry and dynamical systems is uh, a very interesting way forward, and it's ex an exciting time for vision from learning AI, especially with respect to sciences. If you're interested uh, in any of the subjects or uh, would like to collaborate or uh, come join the team, please uh, send me an email. Thank you very much. Okay, Stratus, thank you very much uh, for your very inspiring talk. And uh, your final part uh, brought us to our next uh, speaker, which will, be, which will be in two weeks, and uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, alpha fault exactly. So this is ah. exactly the, the example of how our deep neural networks can be used for uh, fundamental scientific research.
Very nice. That's great Very that, uh, we've made this connection between the two neighboring talks. Yes. Uh, so any questions, guys? I had one question. Uh, when you, your talk was about time, um, and did you work with uh, audio information, <laughs> the simplest and yeah, time data? Uh, no, I haven't worked, uh, uh, to be honest. Uh, there are other people here in the group uh, that work uh, or have worked with audio, but myself have not worked. Thank you. It's a, uh, uh, audio is also very interesting because, so in my experience, um, you know, like, of course, research have to earn money and uh, how they do it is that, uh, for instance, they, they ignore time and they say, my video is going to be a very large image, basically, with lots of channels. And uh, quite interestingly with audio, it's a very similar story. I see uh, they take this mel spectrograms and they say, okay, that's my image now and I'm going to use... Uh, a convolutional neural network and uh, I don't know I see like this recurring theme of um, basically doing hacks uh, to to solve and yeah I don't I don't like it that much I have not worked with audio no it's an interesting area but no, not yeah when you showed the pictures back and forward I was thinking about playing audio before in the back of the reaction <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what is very interesting with audio is uh, a multimodality. So uh, a, a very um, popular now um, area, at least in computer vision, is using different modalities for self-supervision. You use your video or your visual information um, uh, and your uh, audio uh, channels uh, to reinforce each other. It doesn't work perfectly yet, although recent works show that uh, there is complementarity and um, uh, yeah, you can actually do much more uh, than uh, just averaging. That's basically what currently is being done. Okay. Uh, yes, so can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so I have the question regarding the parts of the um, ca causal uh, model. So you have this mm -hmm. ANCO, ANCO model. I wanted to ask because um, I didn't get it. It was probably mentioned uh, a little bit that so you have this uh, intervention scheme. And what I wanted to understand is like what is the way you intervene? So let's say I um, sampled somehow the, the variables over which I'm going to intervene. Now, how do I? What do I change in my graph, and what are the um, the the changes in the distribution that I apply to, let's say, the variables I'm going to intervene on? So, do I sample like uniformly, or do I uh, over possible attributes, or do I slightly shift those values? And uh, is there any like in your theory? Is there other like any uh, specifications over which type of interventions should occur in the uh, in this graph for the theory right. to be true, um, the convergence to appear, yeah. Right, so um, uh, we, uh, we do not uh, make any assumptions or specifications with respect to the specific distributions. Any distribution uh, can work uh, for interventions and the observations. Um, in the synthetic uh, graphs, um, yeah, I think we had, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what, what we used, um, maybe uniform uh, uh, distributions, but it doesn't matter. Like uh, we, we make no assumption on, you know, we have to use one particular distribution only. So it's kind of one single distribution and it's shared across all of the nodes. Or, or do I have like multiple, whatever I w I'm interested in distribution at every node? Right. Uh, yeah, to be very precise, I'm, I, I don't know. I haven't, I mean, uh, Philip knows. I can ask, uh, that's a, a good question. Uh, but what I do know is that the method does not depend on what kind of distribution we, we have or we expect to have. Uh, so I would assume that um, even if we use the same distribution, the same type of distribution, then this doesn't, it's, you, know, you can also have different ones per variable. Okay, and, and I also uh, wanted to ask, so um, can you please maybe a little bit elaborate, so um, how this, uh, so uh, what is the connection between the causal parts of the 
uh, neural networks and like the space time um, idea of that we want to be creating the networks that should uh, yeah so uh, yeah with uh, philip works on temporal causality and uh, temporal causality is about time and causality but uh, we started yeah when we when we started working uh, with uh, this problem we discovered that causality is a very hard area actually um uh, we lack data sets uh, um, simply because you know how do you you can have simulations and simulators but not real data and then like uh, working with synthetic data is always a bit iffy causal structure discovery is uh, uh, much more tangible and concrete basically um, you just need to find the correct causal graph so it yeah, to be honest, it doesn't really connect to time per se, although I can imagine that um, uh, yeah, discovering causal connections between variables uh, uh, could be very much important uh, in uh, you know, inferring the uh, you know, relations over time in, you know, in, in special temporal sequences. But as it stands, the algorithm at the moment has uh, no connection to time. Okay, yes, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, I have one uh, also quick question uh, concerning mm -hmm. the phase, phase transitions. Yes. Uh, I can more or less understand uh, why phase transition becomes more and more um, visible when you when you increase the number of dimensions, but the, I, I don't have intuition why it, it becomes are more visible when you switch to convolutions. Do you have any intuition? No, no that's all. <laughs> ah, intuition. <laughs> intuition. Well, uh, uh, with Adil, we, um, uh, I think uh, um, our idea is that uh, generally the gradients that correspond to the KL term uh, tend to have very large spikes uh, that uh, create the problem. Now, why the gradients? Uh, you know, if that's the case, uh, would it mean that convolutions uh, generate larger gradients? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I don't know. We, we uh, It's really virgin territory for us. We just published the work um, we're exploring. I find it fascinating. I mean, generally, like generally, I think, wait, wh why do algorithms work? Why can we do learning? How do we generalize? Like, why different hyperparameters work and others don't? Uh, why is there this sudden uh, like change in behavior? I think these are somehow connected, but I have absolutely no good answers at the moment. Only questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's very important to, 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 to formulate interesting and insightful questions. Yes. Uh, yes. So I think that uh, we'll try to uh, dig into this paper and maybe uh, well, we'll at least try to, to, to get some intuition because uh, I'm also very interested in such kinds of uh, phase transitions because I think that uh, there's something in it. If we exactly. have so uh, distinct uh, phase transition, this means that uh, there's some, some hidden regularity that is responsible for this phase transition. And it's exactly. uh, quite important to, to, to get some understanding of what's really happening. And, then, and I'm reading your papers to get inspired. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I will also send you an email about the KL. I, will, I have to think a bit uh, about it. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the remark. Okay, good. So, are uh, any more questions? Uh, if not, then uh, let us uh, thank the speaker. Unfortunately, we can't well get just uh, applause. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully, maybe uh, we'll invite you once more, say in a year or two. Yes. I'll be and I, I would I, I yeah okay I will send you also an email I would like uh, to to exchange this okay good so guys uh, our next seminar will be in two weeks because next week we have holidays and in two weeks there'll be our alumni uh, Mikhail Figurnov from DeepMind who will give a talk as I already announced about uh, our uh, Alpha Fold project where uh, he was involved mm -hmm. so thanks everyone cheers bye bye thank, thank you, you very much. much thank you.